getting to some of the um, the best things that that I like to you know that I guess things that I'm I've been um, learning more recently. Um, one of the things that's um, been a mark of my life the last 15, 16 years as we've been traveling, and probably starting a little bit before that, so it's probably nearly the last 20 years, just felt like we've been in a river of revelation. It seems like the Lord just keeping showing us things um, almost continuously. You show us something, and you kind of think, this is the best thing I've ever seen before, ever known. And uh, he gives me some time to... to you know, grow in that, and and it's funny, but I I kind of go through a time where I think I can't imagine there's anything else he can teach me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think I don't, you think there must be, but what could it possibly be? You know, you can't think of any possibilities, and then he shows me something else, and I think, oh my goodness, I never even considered that before, and um, and then I get people come to me, or Denise and I get people come to us, and they say. Um, what books do you read that you get this stuff from? <laughs> and uh, there isn't any books. You know, the, the things that we, are, that we are saying and teaching a lot, there just isn't any books yet. We're, we're trying to get together some books ourselves to try to say them. But, but there's one book where they all are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the, um, you know, that's the kind of great thing about it. Uh, you know, I've, we... we we are told to live our Christian life by living, you know, living according to the Word of God. So you've got to get to know the Word of God and then put it into action. We're, we're told that. Um, I think most of you as Christians would have come across that idea that, you know, you just read the Bible and then you do what it says. I remember one time I was preaching here in my homiletics class as a Bible school student, and um, I held up the Bible and I said, "What is this book supposed to mean to us?" And the lecturer who was taking the homiletics session answered me with exactly the opposite of what I was, what I was going to speak about. <laughs> and he told me he, his answer was exactly what I was saying, it is not. So that kind of made it embarrassing for me to carry on with my message. But, um, you know, we've, we've, we've seen, and, and his answer was, you know, the Bible is our guidebook to live the Christian life. And most of us would think that that's true, right? It struck me a few years ago that the disciples never read the New Testament. Not even once. So what did they use to live their Christian life? You know, if we live our Christian life by following what the New Testament says, what did they live their Christian life by? They obviously lived it another way. Um, they never read the New Testament. But then it struck me they wrote it. So if they wrote the New Testament, what was their source material? You know, what, what were they writing about? Where, where were they getting what they were saying? And I realized, of course, you know, that they were walking in the Spirit, which is what we are to do as well. And when you walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will always lead you according to the Word. And if you're being led in by what you think is the Holy Spirit, but it's not according to the Word. In other words, if you're starting to do something that the Bible says is not of God, then you're not walking in the Spirit. Full stop. No argument, right? I've met a number of people who said, you know, God spoke to me to have an affair with my secretary. I think, no, he did not. <laughs> he will never lead you to go against what the Bible says. But... We don't walk because of what the Bible says. We walk by the Spirit. But the Spirit will lead us according to the Word because when you walk in the Spirit, by the Spirit of God, He will lead you in all of the things, even if you've never read the New Testament, He will lead you in those things. That's what He did with the apostles. And so, you know, there's things I, I used to, um, you know, I read, of course, and knew but then when you understand it like this, and you see, well, okay, the apostles didn't have the New Testament, so why did they write what they wrote? For example, why did the apostle John write, God is love? Like That's not in the, not in the Old Testament. That isn't anywhere in the Bible. That, that is in no other thing. Where did he get that from? Why did he write it? 
Did he write it just because God said, John, God is love, write that? I don't believe so. He, he was being led by the Spirit. And how I see it now is that as he was walking with God by the Spirit, there must have been some day when he had an incredible experience of God's love. Probably an absolutely overwhelming. Maybe it was when he leaned on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. Maybe it was afterwards. Maybe it was years afterwards. But somewhere along the line, he had to have had an experience where he got loved by God beyond what he could handle. So that when somebody later would ask, John, tell us what God's like. And he'd say, oh, I can tell you what God's like. I, I, I experienced it once. God is love. And he writes it down. You know, when Paul wrote the words, therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk every day in the Spirit of the Lord. Why did Paul write those words? Those words aren't in the Old Testament. Those words aren't anywhere in the Bible other than Romans 8. Why? What made Paul write it? See, now, as I understand it now, Paul was walking in the Spirit. And one day as he was walking in the Spirit, he realized something. My goodness. While I'm walking in the Spirit like this, I feel absolutely no sense of guilt or condemnation whatsoever. And so he writes, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk every day in the Spirit of the Lord. He said, if you're walking in the Spirit of the Lord, there is no condemnation, there's no guilt, there's no sense of failure, there's no sense of being left out. You are completely at ease in the presence of God. In fact, you can come boldly to the throne of grace. You can come right into the very arms of Almighty God in His highest position and be accepted there because He has been there and was accepted there. See, the Bible was written by people who were moved by the Spirit and wrote about what was in there, in, in, in that. And so I, what I've discovered, you know, if you, if you just want to learn from studying the Bible, then you'll learn the Bible. But if you want to learn of God, you walk in the Spirit. Because he will take you beyond, not beyond the Bible, but beyond what study can give you. We'll, we'll never go beyond the Bible. But one interesting thing I've discovered is as I'm going deeper into the things of the Lord, it surprises me sometimes, like I experience something, and then when I read the Bible, I discover it's in there. <laughs> it's um, it's quite amazing. I remember one time when I was um, learning something. I was learning about um, you know when Adam first opened his eyes in the Garden of Eden. He must have been looking right into the very eyes of the Father. I mean, he's looking right into the very eyes of total love. And this is the very first experience of his life. The very first thing he ever knows. First impact of anything of awareness, is love of God, loving him. And I remember when I, dis when I discovered that and I realized that, and it suddenly, first, I mean, Ephesians 3 came to mind, and I thought, Paul, you old rascal, like, you knew about this. You know, you knew that Adam opened his eyes and experienced the love of the Father. Because, see, Paul writes there in Ephesians 3, he says, I pray that you have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that passes understanding that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You know, that you would be rooted and grounded in love. Adam was rooted and grounded in love. The very first experience of his being was total love. And that needs to be the experience of every Christian. That one day our eyes get opened and we see the incredible love of the Father for us, just like Adam did. Maybe even more so. And so there's, um, you know, the, the Lord will lead us by the Spirit, but it will always be in accordance with the Word. Paul was way ahead of us. And, and I find that most of the things I'm discovering, I'm just discovering what Paul already knew. But I didn't know that he knew them because I didn't have insight or revelation into the words he was writing. I want to share with you um, something today that has been kind of the... Just, it's just occurred to me in the last uh, 18 months to two years. And it's changed everything. I feel like I've done a, a whole 40-year circuit in my in my pursuit of God, to finally discover this issue. 
um, when I first, before I got saved, I met some people who were baptized in the Spirit, and one particular guy. And when I looked into his eyes, like I could see the Spirit of God in his face. I didn't know that's what I was seeing, but like the connections in his life were sufficient that his eyes were revealing something of the person of God himself. And when I saw that, I really began to want that. I wanted to have that thing in my eyes. And so I discovered after reading a few books that were given to me that what I could see in that guy's eyes was the Spirit of God. And, and I began to want to get baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, but they told me I had to become a Christian first, and that was not what I wanted to do. So it was a big battle to give my life to the Lord. You know, the problem was giving him my life. Because you know, it wasn't that great a life, but it was the only one I had. And I thought if I give it to someone else, what will they do with it? My biggest fear, of course, was that they would take me out of the mountains and out of New Zealand and make me spend my time with people. <laughs> one of the first places we went to was Holland. <laughs> They say the Dutch have got more faith than anybody else in the world. They've cast all their mountains into the sea. <clears throat> yeah. My, my question is, why would you want to cast them into the sea? It's better to have them, anyway. But in this last year or two years, I've come to see something about the Holy Spirit that I never understood before it. And uh, a number of things have changed my understanding of God. He's still doing it even this week. Um, but my, my uh, understanding of him and my knowledge of him is, is growing and experience of him is growing. But I want to share this one with you. And if you've got your Bible with you, I'd like you to, to look first with me um, at Galatians chapter 1. In, um, in Galatians chapter 1, the first five verses... Paul is just giving the introduction. And then in verse 6, he comes straight in with this statement. I mean, he's obviously um, not English. Otherwise, he would have taken a lot more time to build up to his point. <laughs> but <laughs> and would have probably said a lot more gently with more manners. He says, I'm amazed, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. You know, when I think about the Galatians here, Paul came to them and preached the gospel, and they all listened to everything he preached and believed it, and became Christians. And then Paul left, and after he left, others came. And, and the Galatians obviously liked them. They, they were obviously impressed by these people that came. These people preached to them um, about the Lord. They accepted it. They were obviously sincere people. These people lived in their homes with them. They spent meals with them, with these people, the ones that came after and um, and they obviously loved them. They probably gave financially to them um, to support the other ministries that came, the other traveling preachers and teachers that came. And then a long time later, Paul comes back, and he discovers that they're now believing something that he did not teach them. And he says, I'm, I marvel, I'm amazed that you have turned away Basically, from what I taught you before, you've gone into another gospel. The what I taught you now, you've drifted away from. And now you're believing something which is another gospel, but actually it's not another gospel. So what he means by another gospel is this. See, the word gospel means good news. And he says, I'm amazed that you've gone on to another good news, which actually, he says, is not good news. It's not good for you. And, um, and, and you've, you're, what you've believed has become perverted. And you're believing something that's not good news. You know, when Denise and I came to the Lord, and I know for a lot of people, first came to the Lord, we were just filled with joy. 
But as time went on in Christian life, it became what we talked about, the, the wrong tree. This, you know, the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. Trying to live our lives to please God by doing what's good and not doing what's bad. See, the big trap in that is not the bad. We all know bad is bad. But you think that good is God. You think that if I do the good thing, I'm doing the righteous thing. But the whole knowledge of what is good, even, is corrupt. To live by what you believe is good to do and what is bad to do is both the same tree. We don't live by what's good and bad. We live or we walk in something else. And so Paul is facing them. Now, the question that, that I go ask people a lot, and I know it's a difficult, peop- difficult question for a lot of people to answer or say, but the question is this. You know, these Galatians didn't know that they'd been believing the wrong thing. They didn't know. They thought that they were you know, giving hospitality to good people who are really teaching them the gospel, really teaching them the ways of God. Now Paul comes back and says, you've been deceived. These people have actually misled you. They've mistaught you. The question I have is, do you think it's possible that in the Christian life that you've been raised with, that what you've come to believe, Paul might call another gospel? See, that's the question. Whole nations have based their Christianity on right and wrong. Whole focus of Christian denominations. It's all about doing what's right and not doing what's wrong. And when you begin to think about just the the arrogance of that, you realize how can anybody know, no matter who they are, what God would do and what he wouldn't do in any given situation. For us to do what we think is right, even if we've been taught it's right by someone else who thinks it's right, we are still doing what humanly we think is right and wrong. We have to walk by something greater than what's right and what's wrong. And so as I come to to look at something here that I want to share with you, I believe that we're discovering really what the gospel is. And I want you to come with me to another verse in Ezekiel 36. I've mentioned this.